Good morning again. Um, I am so pleased to be introducing our next speaker in the Psych Sessions New Year's Extravaganza Podference. Uh, he is Garth Neufeld from Cascadia College. And when you think about Garth, there's a couple of things that come to mind. One is the word founder and maker. Actually, there's two words, I suppose. Founder and maker. Uh, the other word that comes to my mind when I think about Garth is genuine. And I think you're going to hear that in the talk that he's going to deliver this morning in our podference. Um, Gar Garth is an inventor. He is, uh, he's an innovator. Uh, he invented teaching introductory psychology Northwest as uh, the founder of it. Obviously he's the co-founder of psych sessions. And I can tell you right now, uh, as the other half of that uh, co-founder team, that Psych Sessions would not exist uh, without him. The, in other words, I certainly wouldn't have done it without him. He could have certainly done it without me, but I would not be in it without him. Um, he is the director of regional conference programming for STP. He is co-chairing the APA Introductory Psychology Initiative, a three-year effort sponsored by the American Psychological Association to take a deep dive into uh, the inner workings of introductory psychology in the U.S. And so uh, when I stop and think about all the things that he's involved with, as well as a full-time teaching gig and leading uh, the charge locally, the psychology program at Cascadia, I stop and think about when does this guy sleep? I Seriously, he's incredibly involved on local, regional, and national levels. Um, he has been active uh, on um, different national um, activities as well. The APA Summit for uh, the National Assessment of Psychology in 2016 in Green Bay, Wisconsin. The APA Summit in High School Psychology Education and at Weber State in uh, 2017 as well. Uh, all of this work has obviously not gone unnoticed. And um, uh, recently in 2018, Garth was recognized at a, as a citizen psychologist by the American Psychological Association. In 2019, uh, uh, STP, Division Two of the American Psychological Association, recognized him by awarding him the uh, Wayne Whiten Teaching Excellence Award. And one of the things, if you don't know this about Garth, um, check out, um, just do a Google search on Shared Space for All. He is the president of that organization. His wife is the executive director, and I hope I've got those roles correct. If not, I might have them reversed. And this is an organization that helps uh, young children in Thailand uh, escape what sometimes is a um, unfortunate reality um, of children in that part of the world who go into the sex trade. And they have an organization that they partner with people who live there. They fundraise here and it's shared space for all. And they do an amazing job. Um, and Garth and his wife and others are former board of directors that help out uh, in that effort. And they've been active in that at least since 2015, if not before. So I am pleased to be introducing uh, his talk uh, to you this morning as part of our Psych Sessions uh, Podference Extravaganza. Uh, he delivered this talk at the 2019 American Psychological Association Convention. It was the Psi Beta Ruth Hubbard Cousins Distinguished Lecture. It was uh, originally delivered on August 10th, uh, 2019 in Chicago, Illinois. And Garth's title is, For Innovation's Sake, Breaking the Unwritten Rule of College Teaching. Please enjoy. Thank you. I was uh, thinking this morning about how much giving a talk like this is like hitting the top of a roller coaster. And I hate roller coasters. And, <laughs> but at, by the time you're strapped in, which I think is a year ago when I said yes to giving this talk, you just hold your breath and here we go. So, um, so... If you want to bail out at any point, I get that, um, and I hopefully won't have to do that. Um, <laughs> but it is a privilege to be here and to be um, giving the Ruth Hubbard Cousins Lecture today. And uh, before I begin, I just want to um, acknowledge that Ruth Hubbard Cousins was the original innovator and rule breaker, and that's what we're going to talk about today in teaching. But... Uh, Ruth Hubbard Cousins 
started her professional career uh, with Saikai or continued with Saikai in the late 1950s. And I think for, for me especially, I, I just recently watched a, uh, a documentary on Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I don't know if you've seen this. It was fantastic. I don't know that it quite hit me what it was like to be a woman in the 1950s and how much of a, um, an innovator and rule breaker Ruth Hubbard Cousins must have been. Uh, in her 33 years um, in Psychi, and then also uh, she founded uh, Psi Beta 10 years before her retirement in 1991. Uh, Edward, uh, Edwin B. Newman uh, wrote a letter to Cousins in 1989, and uh, he started Psychi in 1929, and he wrote in the letter, far more than people realize, Psychi is not what we founded. It's what you have made it. And I think that's a testimony to, uh, to her legacy. So again, it is um, my honor to be giving such an esteemed talk in the memory of such an esteemed woman. Okay. <laughs> Mood lighting. Um, and I'm also honored to give this talk on, uh, on behalf of Psi Beta Programming um, at APA. I have now been teaching at community colleges for... Uh, 15 years, and I am beginning to understand what a gift it is to teach in that particular context. And while I hope that many uh, community college students will use the support and, uh, of Psi Beta and do great work in psychology, my day-to-day -day hope is that psychology will do a great work within our students, uh, a transformational work, um, so that they can better serve their communities and their families and their employers and their world because we do have something so valuable to offer them. Uh, so to all of you who teach, but particularly to the community college teachers here who teach section after section of introductory psychology, uh, who run into so many students who have so much more life experience than we do um, and we're supposed to teach them, it's my hope that we will all remember how important our jobs are as teachers and how important our discipline is to community college students and to all college students and to their futures and their families and ultimately their communities. I'm at uh, Cascadia College in Washington State, just north of Seattle, and we have this beautiful campus. You're pretty much looking across the campus. We're small. Um, and in fact, two of these buildings are University of Washington Bothell, a satellite campus of UW, UW Seattle. And um, so it's pretty small. We have 5,000 uh, full-time students. It's a commuter campus, so none of my students live on campus. Um, we were founded in uh, the year 2000, so we are the newest college in Washington State. Uh, we have a value on integrative learning, which was pretty new to me when I first got there a few years ago. Um, and I am, I am just trying out um, or taking tenure out for a spin right now because I just got tenure just a few months ago. So I'm trying to figure out what that's all like, uh, what it's all about. Thank you. It's a long road to tenure. Um, my students are pretty reflective of uh, community college students. They're busy. They have uh, full-time jobs. Lots of them have kids. Some of them are living out of their cars while they try to sort out housing. Some of my students are dreamers, undocumented students, and so it's uh, kind of a scary time for them and has been for the last uh, few years. I have a lot of international students, and then you can mix in a lot of 16-year-old students from the local high schools who I teach um, who... Uh, some of them will end up finishing uh, high school with their AA and going directly as a junior into the University of Washington, Seattle at 18 years old. It's crazy to me. Uh, and so that's what we're working with. Um, and in my teaching uh, at, in higher ed, I've realized that uh, our jobs are just so much more than teaching. To be successful in our classroom is so much about understanding the particular, the particular context where we are teaching. We are always having to adjust and adapt to things. New administrators, new students, new politics, new issues of social justice, not to mention new science and scholarship. So I think we are at our best as teachers when we can start to think out of the box and find innovative solutions to the challenges that we face on a regular basis. Which brings me back to the point of my talk today because in order to innovate in the classroom, we need to... Uh, break out of some fixed ways of thinking. 
The title of this talk is Breaking the Unwritten Rule of College Teaching. Uh, there's only one problem with this title, which is by the time I came back to write this, I couldn't remember what that rule was. <laughs> that, I mean, it was really clear six or nine months ago. And uh, so if you'd allow me, I'm just going to do that. Uh, breaking the Unwritten Rules of College Teaching. But then I really got into it and I thought, well, I've already broken the rule of giving a talk, which is changing your title. Um, so, breaking the written, unwritten rules of college teaching in order to practice responsible pedagogical innovation. So, that's where we'll land today. Uh, we're going to talk about rules and breaking rules. We're going to talk about innovation in general and then also innovation in the classroom. And I think um, my goal today is really to speak to normal teachers, and I hope that comes across today. Um, I'm no expert. I could give you a long list of things in my classroom that I need to do better and that I want to do better, and I'm not beating myself up over it. It's just the case. And I think that a number of us, no matter where we're at, we can always think of things to do uh, better or differently in our classes, ways to improve. So uh, I don't have it all figured out, but I hope to leave you today with something that is a little bit helpful as you think about your own practice um, and your own uh, classroom. So lots of people are talking about innovation. It's a buzzword, and um, the question I have whenever I see innovation, and it's plastered everywhere if you look for it, uh, is what is innovation? Uh, I looked, uh, I, I did a literature search um, on teaching and innovation, so innovation in the classroom, and it was surprisingly thin, actually. So though we assume there are many innovative teachers out there, there might not be a whole lot of research about what makes teachers innovative. But I did find this article, which I thought was uh, pretty interesting, core competencies that are related to teachers' innovative teaching. And this might be hindsight bias, but I feel like what they came up with was what I might have guessed, which is mastery of content is really important, being able to communicate well with a diverse student body and connect with students is really important. Then technological use is really important, being able to effectively utilize technology in your classroom um, but the, the line that stuck out to me here was, in the literature, there's a lack of a specific definition of innovative teaching. Um, so we see innovation everywhere, and yet it's rarely defined, even in the literature. Now, they go on eventually and do define it, but it becomes a mishmash of all the different definitions people have used for innovation, um, and it actually worked for their article. But... Even places like Stanford University are talking about innovative courses. Uh, they have a series of about 10 courses. One of them is called Leading Innovation. Again, it's hard to know from reading the descriptions of these classes exactly what innovation is. I was outside of my hotel uh, two nights ago, and I saw this go by, so it's, it's, it's a little blurry. <laughs> Innovators are the real stars of Chicago. Chicago innovation, year-round events and I have no idea what it's about. It's just innovation. That word works for some reason. But we do know innovation when we see it, right? So if we did a word association here with this uh, Apple logo, it wouldn't be long until somebody yelled out, innovation. Um, and, and probably rightfully so. When Steve Jobs went back to Apple uh, after they were on the brink of bankruptcy, he said, we are not going to cut jobs. We are not going to cut budget to get out of this situation. We're going to innovate our way out of this situation, which they did. And uh, this isn't an essential quote to my talk, but I really liked it. Uh, or, yeah, so let me just share it real quick, which is Steve Jobs said, innovation is saying no to a thousand things. I thought that was really interesting, really focusing on one thing. So now we're circling a little bit about what, what innovation is. Um, this is from CNN Business. Apple wins the patent for a foldable display. Mostly I was just excited about this, so I wanted to show you that this is coming, but this is in their Innovate section. And we actually get closer to innovation here because uh, we've had displays forever, but this is a new kind of display. And so I'll give you a definition um, that in a little bit that is pretty close to what we see here. Moneyball, uh, the 2002 Oakland Athletics. Um, if you don't know this story, uh, people have been fielding baseball teams for a long time uh, in the majors. And what this group of people did with one of the lowest payrolls in baseball 
is use a new way of fielding a team, which is statistical analysis. They didn't have all the money, so they used statistics to figure out what positions do we need to fill and how do we do that with the payroll that we have. And then they ended up winning the World Series that year. Now, Billy Bean, who was the, um, the I think he was, a, was he a manager or was he an owner? I don't know. Anyway, manager. Yeah. So if you ask Billy Bean or uh, Steve Jobs um, whether they thought this would work, I'm sure they were really confident that it would, and that was the right answer. But how many people do you think came up to them and said, this is never going to work, mostly because it had never been done before? And uh, that makes sense to us in retrospect, but I think we're all a little surprised that it did work. Um, if, if, it, if we knew it would have worked, it wouldn't have been innovative. Somebody would have done it before. Um, sometimes innovation completely misses. And I think that's something we've got to get comfortable with. Sometimes innovation in the classroom looks like a new activity that completely bombs or that students hate. Or have you done this one where you assign a new activity, you think you're being a little innovative, and then it's just way too much grading, and you think, I will never give that activity again. <laughs> Sometimes we take a hit on student evaluations when we're trying things out. And for some of us, depending on where we are in career, that's really a, a really important consideration. But if perfection is your goal, then innovation is going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. Related to this, recently I've been thinking about best practices. And not the best practices themselves, but the term best. And I wonder sometimes if best practices are somehow working against better practices. And I wonder if by using the word best, we might be falling into this cognitive trap of believing that there is a single right way to teach, which is extremely limiting and fundamentally an error and quite boring, if you ask me. So become, to become better, I think we have to move beyond best, and we can move beyond best through innovation, which brings me to a relatively simple definition of innovation, which is making changes to something already established, making changes to something already established. And if you're like me, I struggle to think about myself as an innovator. I'm just a teacher. Um, but when we don't think of ourselves as innovators, I think an interesting thing happens. We don't innovate. We don't try. We don't attempt it if we don't start to think about ourselves that way. So recently, I've tried to think about myself as more of an innovator, and I've, I've genuinely come to believe that innovating is not only for the tech heads and the leading scholars of our field. Innovation is really for the rest of us, the regular folks. And I've talked to a lot of people like me. Um, and it seems that there are many of you out there, especially in early and mid-career, who might feel like a bit of an imposter when it comes to doing things in your classroom, to understanding innovation and assessment and those kinds of things. Often we feel like we don't know what we're doing, and we feel like other people do know what they're doing. And in fact, we are probably wrong on both accounts. But this is the perfect recipe for a little conformity and being satisfied with best practices. It's pretty safe. And I actually think it's okay. Best practices, I think, are a responsible way to teach. But let's not forget that many of us have been given this privilege. Now, not all of us, but many of us have been given this gift as educators, which is academic freedom which is sort of like a license for innovation. But before I get to all that freedom, I think we need to do some rule breaking. So let's do a little uh, nominal scale assessment, OK? I realize that you don't, you're not going to want to be put in any of these categories, but I'm going to need a show of hands. I'm going to ask you a question, OK? So by show of hands, who would consider themselves either, um, and hands down for a second, a rule breaker or a rule follower, OK? So if you had to choose one of those, uh, if you would consider yourself more of a rule breaker, hand up. Okay. No, you can't do this, people. You, that wasn't one of the options. Uh, okay, and a rule follower. Oh, interesting. Let me ask. I know some of you fairly well. Am I a rule breaker or a rule follower? I don't think so. I think I'm a rule follower. Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> we can have our, our opinions, I guess. But I, I feel like I'm a rule follower. Now, my wife's... My wife's a rebel. My wife 
Uh, she is a rule breaker by nature, ever since I've known her. Uh, we were recently uh, on a summer trip. We were in Ireland, and we were in the Dublin airport. And in the Dublin airport, they tell you about ten times, take all your liquids, put them in the baggie, uh, make sure that you have them out for us to see. And so what did I do? I took all my liquids out. I put them in the baggie for them to see. And, um, and then I put my stuff through. My wife, she just throws everything into her bag. And then she passes it through, and then she got caught. She got caught by the authorities. And what's, what's really interesting, my wife used to be a flight attendant. So she knows better, but she just refuses. Like, nobody's going to tell me what to do. And so uh, this is her getting in trouble <laughs> at Dublin Airport. Um, you can see, oh, my little daughter, Angelique, is there watching her mom get in trouble. Um, so after I put my shoes on and grabbed my stuff, I was like, I got all this time on my hand. I should take a picture of this. So sometimes following the rules really does pay off. Um, Okay, one more, one more question for you. So by show of hands, who, when they see this sign, they tend to move over pretty quickly so that they can get into the correct lane, so that they can be polite to those around them, make sure that they're not in an awkward situation where people aren't honking and angry. So um, that's one of the options. The other option is you, this is an invitation for you to speed up the side, pass to everybody, cut in at the last minute, be a little bit of a jerk. So can I ask, who merges over politely, nicely, pretty quickly? Well done. Um, and who's the other people? All right. OK. Yeah, look around. We know who you are. Well, inconsiderate rule breakers, I have a message for you. You're right. Oh, you know. You guys don't know. You've just been doing this for so long. Um, Okay, so a lot of uh, studies have been done by uh, departments of transportation in different states, and they've found that there is something called a zipper merge, uh, which works better for traffic flow, which has everybody stay in their lanes to the last second and then z- merge in like a zipper on your, on your jacket. And so uh, Colorado, Washington State, um, Kansas ha- have done this now. And Kansas actually put out this video to help people understand. So it's two cones talking to each other. We're not going to watch it. But uh, two cones talking to each other, explaining it, because you kind of need cones to explain it to us, because we almost don't believe it, right? And I challenge you, even knowing the zipper rule, when somebody races by you in that lane sometime in the future, you're going to get a little upset by it, even knowing that it's the better way to do it, probably because you didn't think of it. Um, So it turns out that you inconsiderate folks are correct. I want, to talk about, I want to talk about family rules for a minute. We're going from the rules of the road to family rules. When, once I was um, uh, in graduate school, and I was uh, studying to get my marriage and family therapy uh, degree, and, and uh, I had this instructor who gave us this terrible assignment, which was go to your family of origin, your extended family, ask them every question you can possibly think of to find more information out about your family. And it was uh, an assignment about unwritten rules. Can you sort out what the unwritten rules are of your family? And the thing about unwritten rules is you never knew they were there. Nobody really talks about them. They're just kind of built into the DNA of the family. And so you do things in certain ways. And that was a really, really scary, reflective process to go in and ask people. I found out things that I never wanted to know. I'm glad I know them now, but I didn't want to know these things. Um, usually it's not like the great things that people uh, hide from the rest of the family, right? It's the, it's the family rules and secrets um, that keep the system running. I learned that my family was unique. We had uh, family rules that didn't exist in other families, and I was unaware of them. I'm so glad that I know these rules, or else they would be in play outside of my conscious awareness. We have rules in teaching, and I don't know that we always know where they come from. And they're very uh, individualistic, but some of them we hold together, but um, definitely some of them are just rules that we have as individuals. Because most of us weren't trained to teach. Anybody trained to teach in here? Yep, a few people. Yeah, high school folks especially. Yeah. Uh, Most of us weren't formally trained to teach, so where did we learn it? Uh, Of course, various places. When I have had the opportunity to um, interview people on Psych Sessions podcast, what I have learned is that oftentimes teachers can tell you about a teacher 
who had a significant impact on them. And this is one of the fun parts of hearing. Uh, well, generally, sometimes people uh, had a teacher who uh, reminded them how not to teach, uh, which happens as well. So I'm gonna, we're going to do a little uh, active activity, uh, a little active learning activity really quick. I want you to think about who was it, where was it, and why was that teacher memorable, and get into groups of two or three and take about 30 seconds to share your teacher. It can be a tribute to them. Think about it that way. It's not often that we get to reflect back on those things, right? Somebody really has to ask us about it. Um, and, and this was a really, as I was preparing for this talk, I thought back on one of the more influential teachers that I had who was my high school English teacher. His name was Mr. Clark. And this is him. I just found this on the internet. Uh, I, I almost didn't recognize him because it's been like, I don't know, 25 years or something, a long time. And, and I... I love this guy. And it's not, it's not because he was a nice guy. He was mean. He really taught us how to write. He was rigorous. Uh, he was the first person that demanded something of me when I was a student. And he taught me how to write. I remember a five-paragraph essay. It's like That's what we really worked on. And there was something in me that resonated with that in him. And honestly, as I reflect on my teaching, especially the first... 10 years of my teaching career, when I had no idea what I was doing, guess who I looked a lot like? I looked a lot like him. I really had these high standards. Now, I don't think that was a great practice for me at the time. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But this was inspiring to me, this this class. And I think that it was a very, very formative for me. Um, since most of us weren't trained as teachers, it's reasonable to think that the instructors that we have had have impacted our teaching, probably without our knowledge um, of, of, of the extent to which that they have impacted us. And it may not be a good or bad thing, it just probably is. Of course, there are a thousand other things that have impacted the way that we teach. Um, but I've learned one more thing in interviewing teachers, and that is reflective practices like this are really important. And it seems to me like lots of the good ones, they do have a reflected practice built into their teaching. They make notes after a class about what worked and what didn't. They're curious as to why students responded this way and not that way. I've seen it in really good teachers again and again. In 2016, Gurung, Richmond, and Boyson published this book, which came out of an STB presidential task force, and they determined that one aspect of competent instruction or a competent instructor is the ability to reflect on their own teaching and feedback about their teaching. In fact, most of their teacher competencies that they recommend and highlight have a built-in component of reflection. Here's a quote. Model psychology teachers skillfully apply varied instructional techniques. They intentionally plan, implement, assess, and revise learning interventions to achieve the central objectives of psychology education. To, model, to the model teacher, pedagogy is not static. It's ever-evolving, right? It's innovative. It pushes boundaries. It's curious and critical, even if it means bumping up against the rules. So let's look at some rules that you and I might subscribe to in our classrooms. Have a quick look through this list and see what your emotional and cognitive response is to some of these rules. Now we might disagree on whether these are good or bad practices or beliefs, but one thing is certain. If these become too rigid or too many, our pedagogical freedom starts to become limited. So maybe a valuable and reflective question here is, are you aware of your own rules and how they impact your students and your teaching? Because we can break any of the rules. Is it responsible to break these rules? Well, it depends. We need a way to think about this. So let's talk about responsible innovation. I saw this come up on Twitter this week. Thanks, Eric. Uh, discussions of academic freedom are important, but does anyone else notice that we rarely have discussions about academic responsibility? Well, we are going to talk about academic responsibility now. 
Because we don't want innovation and change just for the sake of change. We want to focus on responsible change. We are here to make things better. Scholarship of teaching and learning and learning science are very helpful guides when it comes to responsible, innovative practice. So first, let's talk about scholarship of teaching and learning, which is testing out our teaching methods in the classroom environment and then measuring the effectiveness of those, and then publishing in a peer-reviewed journal. Um, Now, if you look at our major teaching journals, they may not have a lot to say about innovative teaching by topic, but they are full of innovation. You see it everywhere. So I just went into the most recent uh, journals, teaching journals from this last uh, month or quarter, and I pulled out a couple articles that looked interesting to me. So I want to bring those here. Here's one. Learning to give reverse causality explanations for correlations. Now, this really resonates with me. My students don't get it. My students don't get causation, and correlation and the difference. And so what these researchers did is they uh, decided to innovate um, a method by which they could train and teach their students um, how to know the difference between correlations and causations and then uh, test them on it later. And this is one of my... This is one of, I feel like this is one of the most challenging uh, things for students to get when it comes to correlation and causation, but it also might be the linchpin, which is if they can understand that, a, that correlations are not causation because A could lead to B and, and B could lead to A, and, and they can understand that and apply it, then they're on their way to understanding the difference. So uh, optimism about future and... Um, and grades, your grades. And so students might, um, if those two things are positively correlated, students might think, well, yeah, if you're feeling good about the future, you're going to do well in uh, your, your classes. But alternatively, they need to be able to say, and if you're going to do, if you're doing well in your classes, then you would be feeling optimistic about the future. Both those things could be true. And that's why uh, correlations are different than causation, because they don't tell us the direction, right? Well, it turns out that when, you, when they put this into practice with their students and really targeted this, it didn't work. It didn't work for them. They try, I mean, they did it exactly the way I would do it in my classroom and actually do it in my classroom. And this wasn't an intro psych classroom. This was a social psychology and research methods classroom. And students were getting, uh, it's about 50% rate of students being able to do this reverse causality uh, explanation of correlation. So, um, yeah, but these, these teachers are innovative. Right? They're, they're finding a problem. They're finding a new way of addressing the problem. They're putting it into the classroom. And now we have this great study uh, where we learn uh, to either try to replicate this in our classes or to try something new. Now, I really liked this article, Think, Pair, Freeze. And what this article is about is students who have social anxiety, which in, this, uh, in their research they found uh, that it was very high. I'm talking like half of students identified with some sort of social anxiety. What they did was uh, test out whether, uh, or run some correlation to figure out if those students uh, do well and thrive in active learning. Because we have just been told active learning. That's the way you should teach. Don't lecture. Let's make sure that we do active learning. Uh, these students don't do well with active learning. Uh, it doesn't really work for them. Now, to me, this is an innovative article and, and maybe a platform for innovation or um, really this is a license. They are sending us out to be innovative because they're saying, we've got this problem here, so let's go solve it. And I suspect that they will have an attempt at, at a solution here shortly in their next uh, research study because this is a really big deal. This affects so many of our students. Responsible innovation uses scholarship of teaching and learning. As a launching point, we read these things and then we start to think about our own classes and we start to innovate solutions. Uh, but also, learning science is really a great starting point for uh, innovation. So I know that we've, most of us have seen this. This is the Dunlowski um, and others article. And this is my favorite little PDF that I hand to like uh, other teachers who haven't seen it before. I don't know, it's about 10 pages long on the right-hand side, uh, what works, what doesn't. It talks about the gold standard. 
uh, in, in learning methods, in, in, in study methods, which are retrieval practice and distributed practice. And honestly, if you get those two things, you can overhaul an entire course with those two pieces of information from learning science. And it's a responsible way to go. Um, great books out there on this. Ambrose, um, Make It Stick. The new one, I haven't read it yet. Anybody read it yet? Looked at it? Okay. Well, it's getting around, so uh, it looks like it is the, the next thing that people are reading. I think that science, uh, learning science and scholarship of teaching and learning are kind of like a playground. And I spend lots of time on playgrounds with my seven-year-old. So these are the things I think about. Um, now, for innovators, I think uh, that, that there are, there are two, kind of two levels. There are the people who make the equipment. And we don't all have to be those people. We have the Aaron Hardens and the Lindsay Maslins and the Landrums and the Grungs and the, the Hallinans and the Duns, and they're really good at building this stuff. All we need to do is play on it, right? So we don't all have to feel like this is ours to construct. There's some really good stuff that's already out there. Our job is to get across the monkey bars, especially if you're being chased by a lava monster. Um, in one of the... In one of the more cynical and inspirational essays I've read on this topic, which is pretty tongue-in-cheek, uh, Chu and Serban remind us to think, to be critical consumers of pedagogical claims, to understand the nuance of successful implementation of methodologies, and to keep thinking like a scientist. So here's the essay. If you've not read it, it is fantastic. I will uh, I'll give you an example. You ready for this? Uh, it's too much to put up on the screen, so here we go. If we were to synthesize current trends in pedagogy, we would conclude that the best, best teaching practice is high-impact, student-centered, engaging, hands-on, just-in-time, technology-enhanced, flipped, blended, hybrid, transformational, cooperative, collaborative, reflective, authentic, situated, guided, integrative, supplemental, reciprocal, gamified, experiential, adaptive, disru uh, disruptive, and active. It is also brain-based, peer-based, inquiry-based, group-based, team-based, project-based, case-based, community-based, discovery-based, competency-based, evidence-based, mastery-based, research-based, service-based, problem-based, and data-driven not to mention massive, open, and online. <laughs> so we see the problem here. Thankfully, they do guide us towards a solution, which is we should not be looking for the single best teaching practice. In other words, we've got to play. Um, there is no magic bullet. There, is on, there are only good and bad and neutral pedagogical strategies that we get to test out in our specific contexts where we teach. So we don't mindlessly get on the bandwagon of OER or team-based learning or exam wrappers or eliminating cell phone use or laptop use in the classroom or even active learning. Instead, we think about it. We reflect on our context and we implement and innovate and assess. So let's stay on this chew train for one more moment. This came out uh, last year, and it's, it's a call for instructors to implement the basic scientific values that we hold and that we teach our students and apply them to teaching. Here's another great quote. I really see two important parts here. Applying what we know through learning science and scholarship of teaching and learning and then measuring the effectiveness of those interventions. So it's just it's scholarly teaching. And the only thing that I would add to this more explicitly, and I think it's in there, so I'm just piggybacking, but explicitly is this reflective and innovative practice. And so I want to propose a model, a cycle of responsible innovation, where reflection is both the starting point and the ending point. The starting point where our pedagogical innovations are carefully planned, based on SOTL and learning science, and the results of those innovations are reflected on, particularly with regards to the context and the way that we have implemented something. Reflection is a major practice, a major piece of this cycle. So what does this look like in the classroom? Uh, mostly I want to show you that normal teachers can do this. We just need to get unblocked from some rules that we might hold. And so let me give you an example. A number of years ago when I had, uh, had been doing uh, my syllabus just the way I'd been doing my syllabus for 10 years, I realized 
that I have this unwritten rule that the most and only important purpose of syllabi is to clearly communicate course information. And um, I don't know that there's anything wrong with this for like clearly telling students what's expected of them, making sure that it reads like a boring legal document, a contract, some have said it. If you're really rigid, then this is your contract for the class, right? Uh, which was me at one point. But then I saw this talk by Lana Connor, and she discussed, among other things, this is at Psych 1 a few years ago, five years ago, something like that. Um, among other things, she talked about um, how wording in your class and your assignments and your syllabus can really do a lot to help or hurt people from collectivist culture. And so uh, I saw the research, I reflected on the research, and I thought to myself, that would work. I can innovate in my context. I think this is going to work for me. So what I did is uh, I moved from uh, words like I and you to we and us, and I wrote this up at the beginning of my syllabus before we got into any of the classroom stuff. So um, I talked to students you know, afterwards, and I asked them informally, what do you think about this? My students liked it. Uh, I also uh, saw that students thought I was more engaging on my uh, end of quarter evaluations afterwards. I'm not sure what that was due to, but I really feel like this couldn't hurt, especially based on Alana Connor's research. So here's what I did. I, um, I reflected on her very compelling research. I thought about how it would come across in my community college class. And I adapted it. I, in I innovated it specifically into the beginning of my syllabus. And then I assessed informally with students. Uh, last week, I had a, a colleague that I used to work with. She's an adjunct, and she's adjuncting somewhere else now. She's about to teach research methods for the first time. And she said, can I get your syllabus from you? And I um, sent it off to her because she was looking for assignments and how the course is structured and all those kinds of things. We had a phone conversation, and she said to me, uh, the first thing she said, I didn't know that you could, uh, you, your voice could be like this in a syllabus. Nobody had ever told her. And I said to her, yeah, me either. It took me 10 years to get, to get that knowledge or to understand that I have the freedom to do that. And she was really thankful for that. And so it was, it was a reminder to me that this is pretty important. It's good to look at the rules that we've put around ourselves unknowingly. Um, I've broken a lot of rules in my course courses. Um, using this process. For example, I teach way less content um, now than I, than I used to. I probably cover 60% of what I used to cover. Um, I assess half of probably what I used to assess in terms of coverage. And I probably increase the amount of skills and application and reflection that I do in my classes by three or four times now. So these are all decisions that I've made after reflecting and reading um, and then implementing assessment. I need to talk to Jane some more about assessment. So, um, but after we're through here, if you want some specifics, I can tell you about some other things that I do in my class specifically. Now, to be honest, I used to view assessment as kind of a burden, and assessment was always really hazy to me. Uh, but with this, with, with SOTL, thinking through SOTL and, um, and this cycle and learning science in this kind of way, in my particular context, I wouldn't say it's quite fun yet, but it is definitely more clear to me what's going on in my classroom, which I think is a big win. Um, I've really changed so much in my classroom. I, I slashed the first two weeks of content in my intro psych course just to put, on a, put uh, a study skills module in there. They're not getting it anywhere else. We have a College 101 class at uh, Cascadia College. They're not getting it there. It's crazy to me. So uh, I think this is the best way that I can serve my intro psych students is to give them that study skills uh, piece. With all that, I just uh, encourage you to, to make sure you... Um, Oh, wait. I'm not done yet. So this is one of my favorite emails I received this year. You ever have those? You put those in a, like a little box, an inbox, or you save them on your computer somewhere. Uh, this email came from a student of mine who would have been fine without me. She was one of those kinds of students, you know. She was uh, she's 45 years old, uh, has, had come back for, to community college for a second career, and uh, she, she went through this two-week uh, uh, module on learning skills, and 
or on study skills and learning. And she emailed me, the first paragraph is that she was helping, it was a year later, she was helping another student out with their study practice, and she wanted to some resources that I had shared with them. And then there's the second paragraph that says, thank you for that. The best gift I could have received as a student was taking your class first. Learning how to learn has impacted my study habits and school life more than I can tell you. I appreciate that you made us focus on this. How great is that? So with all this, break the rules. Use the playground. Innovate responsibly. And remember David Eagleman. There he is. Remember David Eagleman. I love David Eagleman. Uh, If you don't know who he is, he's a neuroscientist, and he also does, like, poetry and all kinds of arts things. Um, Recently, he put out a Netflix special, which is an hour long, called The Creative Brain. It's based on this book. And he talks about creativity, and he talks about innovation. And I want to summarize uh, his points, because I think they work really nicely with with the the points that I've made here today, which is, if you want to innovate... Do these three things intentionally. Try something new. It's the very definition of innovation. Something that you've been doing forever, just rethink a new, better way of doing it. Two, push boundaries. And this is more internal than external. Uh, These are the unwritten rules that naturally inform your teaching processes. They need to be challenged and looked at. And you may want to ask somebody else what boundaries you need to push because we have blind spots. Finally, take risks. Remember, innovation and perfection are incongruent. We've got to take risks if we are going to be innovative. And finally, I want to uh, just give a shout-out to a hometown hero, Herbie Hancock, who tells an amazing story here about a, a, a valuable lesson that he learned playing music when he was really young. You know, us normal teachers, we often feel like imposters. Like, if we're not hitting the wrong notes, we are going to hit the wrong notes soon. But this is a great reminder. Stop with the rules. Stop with the self-judgment. You're fine. You can innovate. We all can, even if we're going to make mistakes along the way. It has been such an honor to give this talk today. Thank you very much.